And Harold, this is uh, Don. Don. Uh, well, we're live. Welcome to um, my MFA lecture. Um, we'll start in a little bit. Um, okay. okay and then we'll, more people coming. Yeah, we'll wait for more people to arrive. And in the meantime, if you haven't already, feel free to um, peruse the little mini installation that I put together. It's got um, some printed things. Um, the text from the Susan Sontag um, that we referred to. Um, it's, got some text. it's got some movement scores if you'd like to use this studiously. All right. Um, Hi. Yes, we've met before. Hi, Rebecca. Nice to meet you. I see you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so
Hi mom. <laughs> Hi mom. <laughs> Hi Bray. No, oh, you're you're can you mute your microphone? Uh, I can't hear so well, but that's okay. Um, we'll be watching. Okay, so just watch, and um, I might have to mute your microphone because uh, there's a lot of back noise. Don't worry about it, Grace. I will just be watching. Yeah, don't pay attention to us. <laughs> Hi. Hi, welcome. How did your parents um, stay? Do you want to sit here? No, you can stay there. I'll sit up there. Yes. <laughs> you can sit on the ground. Yeah. Can you sit here? No, you shouldn't. <laughs> So uh, I'll begin with a few announcements. Um, if you haven't already, please remove your shoes. Um, take a seat anywhere you'd like to. The restroom is right through the door through the kitchen, and it's the first door um, to your right. Um, and you can enter that at any time. And hopefully when you walked in, you picked up a little um, slide frame viewer. Yes? Yes. Yeah, a slide frame. Oh, uh, you'll get one. They're very tiny. But easy to miss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I need a one. You need a one? Yes. So thanks for your patience in getting started. I believe I will, I'll, I'll wait just maybe a minute more. Um, <laughs> I feel like in the archive broadcast, I wonder if I can fast forward and take a little first But I would probably Hi there. Come on in. Maybe what I'll do is um, if someone could write a tiny little note that says we've begun, we've begun, please enter quietly. Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, so then I can close the door. I think I uh, will get better mm -hmm. uh, projection when I close the door. Uh, thanks for doing this. Um, I'll begin by welcoming you. Welcome um, to my graduate MFA lecture talk. Um, it's been a real honor to work and spend time with you, learning alongside you, and um, and uh, it's exciting to be able to share um, a summary of three years um, in the program. Uh, let's see. So I'll begin. We can move to our first frame, or our first slide. And I thought about structuring this talk, um, thinking about frames. And, um, and you picked up a, a slide frame. And um, these ones, uh, we could go back. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so not these particular ones, but these slide frames in general, the, the docents at the Portland Art Museum use for teaching, for focusing, close looking, um, and um, and I thought they were a great metaphor and a great tool for thinking about how uh, I've grown to identify certain frames, um, expand certain frames, and, um, and identify new frames um, throughout my practice um, here in the program. 
Um, a frame in the dictionary is defined as um, both a noun and a verb. Um, it's an open structure that gives shape and support to something, um, such as an aircraft fuselage or a skeletal beam, either for a body or a building. Um, it's the enclosing case or border into which something is fitted, as opposed to a frame for a picture. It's the system around which something is built, such as the frame of a government. Um, it's a condition, uh, for example, this, a frame of mind. Um, it's also uh, used to describe a strip of film using the motion picture, um, using making motion pictures, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, and as a verb, it means to construct by fitting parts together to draw up the plans or basic details for or outline a frame for basic policy, uh, to compose, contrive, or conceive, to frame a reply, as well as to provide support or enclose with the frame. So I was thinking about these frames, um, personal, personal frames, historic frames, art historic frames, institutional frames, time, time frames, all these kinds of frames. I was thinking about how um, these things have grown and changed or expanded for me. I was talking to someone who makes films, and we were talking about, he was telling me about an open frame versus a closed frame. And um, maybe, Erica, you're familiar with the kind of shot, uh, like a, a kind of shot that's an open frame shot or a closed frame shot. Um, but what I learned is that a closed frame is where everything that the viewer needs to know is contained within the frame. Um, whereas in an open open frame, it's where uh, someone or something else is being pointed to or acknowledged outside the frame. And as the viewer, we're led to interpret that there's more uh, to what's going on than what we can see, or what the director is allowing us to see. Um, so I'll be loosely structuring my talk with this idea of framing frameworks of the museum, the school, the body, public space, and the limits and possibilities of each. Um, can you go to the next one? Oh, one before. So it should say dialogues, or a dialogue. Um, and this is um, an excerpt from the book that I just printed called Movement Scores. And um, I'll just read it aloud. A dialogue. Says the, says the learner to the teacher, show me the way outside myself. Says the teacher to the learner, I can only show you the way I've come, and point to the ways of others. Says the artist to the teacher, making is thinking, and learning is what occurs at the instance of activity. Say the teachers to each other, we make the road by walking, we write upon the ground with our steps, and the land becomes both a map and our history. Says the teacher to the learner, learn alongside me. Says the artist to the teacher, learn alongside me. So the different footnotes there um, are referenced um, in the book. Um, and as I was writing this, I realized um, afterwards that either, all of the points of view, all of the frames um, are coming from myself, like how I viewed myself both as a, le a learner, a teacher, and an artist. Um, and the thing that, is, uh, that I keep coming back to is this idea of learning alongside or coming alongside someone. Um, before I started the program, um, we could move to the slide with me teaching. <laughs> um, before I came to the program, uh, my experience was such that I was teaching in museums. Sometimes it looked like this. Um, and the way that I viewed the museum was as a learning lab. That was my, my frame of reference for the museum, was that it was a place um, where I wasn't confined to the restrictions or the objectives are the standards of a school, um, or, but we could um, we could construct and make our own objectives and our own activities. So sometimes it looked like this. We can advance. Sometimes it looks like this. Advance. Sometimes it looks like this. Sometimes it was outside. Sometimes we made things as a way of learning about things. And always there was this um, display or presentation of work. Um, we can go one more. And 
Um, we can stay here for a moment. And um, the museum as a learning lab frame um, is full of possibility when it celebrates the work of young people and gives them a platform to speak to their peers in their community. It's also full of possibility when the public can make it their own. And so this is an example um, I felt of when I felt the museum as a frame was an expanded one. This is Um, when I started the program, um, there was an assignment um, that we should have an artisan residence with an organization. So what I did was a friend of mine had started a, um, an organization called Here the Hungry, where they would hand out Subway sandwiches to people who were sleeping in Penn Station. And this particular uh, weekend was close to Thanksgiving. And they had written on their sandwiches, happy holidays, love here, the hungry. And I had just finished reading The Gift by um, Lewis, Lewis Hyde. Is that the name? Lewis Hyde. This sounds funny right now. OK, it was The Gift. Um, and I was thinking a lot about giving and taking, about the hierarchies and the obligations um, in, in, in that economy, uh, among, among lots of other really great things that he had written about it. And instead of um, thinking about what I was giving, I was thinking about giving and taking in a different, uh, I was trying to frame it in a different way. So on the sandwich, I, was, I wrote take comfort. And um, we, um, many, of the, many of the people that I was with um, met people that they knew uh, because they had done, they would go and they call it the rounds. And they would go on the rounds often. And so they were running into people they knew. And I didn't know anyone, and I sort of felt a little bit awkward and strange to assume that somebody needed a sandwich. Um, or even when they were sleeping on the floor, um, I learned later that the only time that they could sleep without being interrupted were during the daytime hours, because I think it was um, at 2 or 3 in the morning um, they were kicked out for cleaning. Um, so I had also prepared some other things, and I was thinking about um, if, if this sandwich that I'm giving didn't come to me at any cost, um, you know, what, uh, what is the exchange if I'm giving this away? So I tried to come up with other things that I really needed or wanted to take um, to give me comfort. And, um, and it happened on this, in this waiting room. And I happened upon um, this man, Steve, and, and we had a moment and we shared and we had a, a long conversation about comfort. And he had told me that one of the things that he really took comfort in was to be able to just go outside, um, have some fresh air, take his shoes off, put his feet up. And um, that was his way of taking comfort. Um, after about a, maybe an hour, hour and a half, um, we gathered outside and we're just kind of um, touching base. So this is it's a pretty dark photo, but um, we, there were a bunch of us kind of sharing stories about who they saw, who they didn't see. And, uh, and I shared my story. And as we were walking to this corner, I saw a man with a hood over his, um, over his head. And um, he had his shoes off, uh, he had his shoes off and his feet on top of his shoes and I walked quicker and I was like, you stinky feet, right? And I walked faster and, um, and my friend Kristen was like, hey, that's your friend. Um, and, but I had walked too far past and so I thought that that was um, an interesting part of the story that I don't, I hadn't always included, but, um, but it made me think about the limits of um, when we call something a project or we think in the frame of mind that this is a project and this is not, or this is an assignment or this is not. Um, next. So I was able to, um, uh, in the in the context of how I was working with the museum as a um, a freelance uh, contracted um, educator, um, I was thinking also about Paul Tech. This is a piece that was in um, at the Whitney for a retrospective of his work. And I was thinking about this, and um, and I was talking about iProgram to my manager at the time. Um, and she suggested that I work with a group of eighth graders um, at the school called Quest to Learn, and she was really excited about what I was um, uh, what I was exploring um, in my MFA program. So I approached the students with the same question, and um, at the museum there were there was also the current exhibit um, was had Rikrit Tervenit's uh, Untitled Free Still, which was a curry. It also had, um, it was also showing um, Felix Gonzalez Torres's, uh, one of his 
candy um, pieces. Uh, this particular one was installed in two different um, long rectangular areas, um, as well as a, a Fluxus exhibition. And so the inquiries that I had um, fit really nicely in this tradition. So we're able to ex experience these um, firsthand, which also I felt um, is, uh, is something that I, I look to a museum frame to um, hold on to these things for firsthand experiences. Um, so the students then uh, took the question of um, giving and taking comfort. What is comfort? Um, how do I, what do I compromise for myself when I give or, or take comfort? And um, many of the students did um, things like giving away hot chocolate, um, making a dance about gifts, um, and uh, one was giving free hugs, one was giving compliments and slapping them on your back. Um, and, uh, and, this and there was one particular student who decided that he wanted to go outside. And, um, and on Fifth Avenue, um, he had said um, that he wanted people to stand outside with um, suggestions like, I can translate, or I can give you restaurant tips, or I can give you directions, and offer a service um, on the street. And so um, these are some of the photos that I took on um, that day. And I thought it was really, um, really touching because the student, the teacher later told me, you can advance. Um, the student um, is a, it was terribly, terribly shy that at first they thought that when the student attended the school that um, he may be mute. Um, and over the course of this year and, um, and uh, spending time together, we can go back. Um, he was opening up and feeling more comfortable with his peers. And so she said that she was really surprised also that his project was the one that was most vulnerable and most um, public. And, um, and I would say that this was probably the first, um, the first time I felt in a museum that I wasn't just giving or just teaching, um, but I was also receiving and learning um, alongside with the students. Or perhaps I felt just as vulnerable as the students. Um, and, um, and I'm really grateful to um, um, Jessica Walden Popper who gave me that opportunity. Um, another thing that came out of this, um, we can advance the next, the next one, um, is that um, this idea of documentation um, came up, and um, and the museum requested documentation to then use the images how they wanted to. And I was thinking, uh, a student made a comment of like, "Now you own my face. You can do whatever you want to my face and my image and likeness." And so I thought about that as that that being quite true. And so I came up with a way to make it a bit more equal by creating this mutual pledge of documentation and representation. And this was, um, and, and this uh, way of working together, um, creating a statement of intention and making um, trust visible was something that, um, that I experienced when working with Eric um, Fabian um, when I met him in New York and we put together a, an event called um, Good Meet. And it was about uh, bringing people together and creating an, uh, an unconference on the topic of sanctuary. And um, the first thing he did with me was to, um, as, as he was writing out a um, contract, was um, he asked, what is the ethical orientation of our collaboration? Um, and he asked uh, three questions. Um, what is the ethical orientation we each bring to our partnership? Can we be better? How will we measure the ethical success of our project? Um, and so our answers together were pay attention, do no harm, create value, make it meaningful, provide a right livelihood, be honest about mistakes, share knowledge, respect the marketplace of ideas as well as stuff, make your partner look good, respect dialogue. Um, and it went on for a bit long. Um, and so, um, so this is just then after they gave their presentation, um, they were walking from the school to where they were giving the presentation. It kind of became a parade. Um, so as my roles um, of both uh, being a teacher, learning to be an artist, and, um, and being a learner, um, I was thinking about these roles and these interchangeable roles a lot. And, um, 
And I think through the rest of the presentation, you can see how the roles were sort of cyclical and, and fed into each other. But um, it's kind of difficult to read, but I was trying to think about those things that a learner and a teacher shared, those things that an artist and a learner shared, those things that an artist and a teacher might have shared, and those qualities that all, all three may have shared. Um, can you read it to us? Yeah. So, let's see. So I expected a teacher to organize, distill, filter, structure, correct, grade, evaluate, set rules, plan lessons, be patient, be selfless, give assignments, um, as the things that I sort of marginal, uh, put in the margins of what only a teacher might do. Um, between a learner and a teacher in the middle there, it says be held accountable to share, mm -hmm. to ask questions, to be open, listen, reflect, research, and work. And those are things that all three share. Um, as a learner, I, I thought the expected role of a, of a student would be um, to obey rules, do assignments, be transformed, make connections, display and present knowledge, be curious, uh, sketch, solve problems, experiment, play, and produce something. Um, and um, as an artist, these, these are not things that I expected of myself or what I felt were roles that were expected of me or things that maybe I expected of my students. Uh, so then as a the role of an artist, I have um, perform, improvise, provoke, challenge, break rules, follow their own interests, turn things upside down, step outside the comfort zone, problematize, reframe, and those are things that I expected um, just an artist to do, either when I was in the role or when I was with another artist. Um, yeah. And I think the only thing that I didn't mention is the where the artist and the teacher um, overlap and that's pose problems and be an expert in quotation marks. Um, so we can move forward. I feel a little bit like I don't have control because I can't advance when I want to. Um, but um, So I'll go through these a little quickly. They're meant to just be contextualizing. Um, so I wanted to escape the institution or the frame of the institution because I felt like I didn't have a lot of agency. And I wanted an institution or an art space that was more um, on, a, on a level of dialogue with its neighboring community as opposed to one that was just providing a service. So I had the opportunity um, to use this lost space and turn it into a gallery. And it was being um, currently rented by a church who used it on Sundays. And Monday through Saturdays, um, they wanted programming or they wanted it to be used. So um, up in the top uh, left corner there, um, a family that would come um, to almost every family day at the Center for Architecture came and drew on these plans. Um, on the bottom is co-working, which Eric tried. Uh, Eric helped me um, try out um, in a space during the day. And then on the right is um, something called the Last Supper Salon, which a, an artist named Coralina Meyer um, was organizing at the time. So we were kind of bringing all these people together to talk about how we could use this. Um, there was also a rooftop, and um, on the left is an image of, this, of an art, a teacher and artist from Pratt who was uh, figuring out a new sort of um, this structure, a roof structure that we were able to install. And then on the right is the group of people that came together to talk about sanctuary. Um, another thing I attempted was to start my own business. It was called Pop-Up Art Studio. And with Leanne Boyd, um, we decided instead of being uh, limited to what the institution or the museum wanted to teach, uh, wanted us to teach, we would teach what we wanted to teach. And um, so we taught ourselves how to um, do paper making, and we took the paper making mobile, and we went to the streets and the parks and um, tried to get a clientele that would pay us to do these things. But that's one thing that an individual um, bears and the, bears the brunt of, and an institution has the power to support, which is um, a mailing list and a and a a public that already exists. So um, thank you, Brian. Um, so what I did have the capacity to do was um, organize a community exhibition about um, artists who were using paper. And um, on the uh, jury committee, I had um, someone who was on the board of, uh, of, the, of the church. So it was the pastor there. It was myself, Leanne, 
um, an artist, a printmaking artist who was teaching at Columbia University and uh, a high school student that I had previously worked with. So we were the jurors for um, selecting the works for this show. Um, thank you. Um, and so here's a shift in where I felt that um, forget about the you know forget about the institution of teaching or um, or learning. Um, what is peer pleasure for me? And um, and I found this opportunity on NIFA, um, the New York Foundation for the Arts. Yeah, New York Foundation for the Arts. And um, at the time, Bonnetter Gallery um, in Chelsea, there was um, a show with the work of Laura Lima along with a couple other Brazilian artists. And it was called The Naked uh, Magician. And it was my first taste of sort of improv acting um, in an art and gallery context and the ability to lead and mislead. So from the press release, The Naked Magician, this was in 2011, um, this performance installation by Laura Lima uh, features a magician with short sleeves at work. A metaphor for the artist in the studio, the magician works alone, organizes his or her effects, makes notes, and creates strange and sometimes bad sculptures. The shortened jacket arms indicate that there are no tricks up her sleeves, as the audience is given access to the machine's mag magician's routines and secrets. Born in 1971, Lima's work is primarily concerned with the human body, often as a part of a larger whole, whether connecting to or contradicting other objects. In many works, the body performs metaphors of social relationships between the individual and the collective body and articulates connections and obstacles between bodies and objects. As described by the artist, I am more interested in the intricate social relationships, the exchange of behaviors that in time serve to alter our perception of the quotidian, the everyday. So I was um, one of many um, volunteers uh, that would come and perform in this gallery. And here I'm making a chart that charts out the similarities and differences or the connections between magic and art. Mm -hmm. So um, then I packed up and left my apartment in, um, in Brooklyn. This is where I was mostly taking class. Uh, I was mostly in class in this corner of the room. And, um, and I moved to the West Coast, to San Francisco. Um, and so in San Francisco, um, I was uh, one of the lead teaching artists for Southern Exposure's uh, Mission Voices team program. For the summer, I was working with two other lead artists, um, and, um, and we each had assistants, which was awesome. And um, my assistant was only a couple years younger than me, lived in San Francisco for, you know, 10 years. So he was the expert, as far as I was concerned. And, um, and we started, we learned about this game called geocaching, and I was, um, and uh, are you guys most people familiar with what this game is? Mm -hmm. It's a game that uses GPS coordinates to um, hide little treasures around, and usually they lead you to um, points of interest or historic landmarks. And um, I think the thing that really stuck out to me was how fun it made something that um, that uh, I was doing with the Center for Architecture. A lot of our learning by design tours were walking tours that were about um, local local and um, historic landmarks. Um, so I wanted to take this idea, and um, and and I, this is the idea that I pitched to Southern Exposure over their teams that through um, that in the mission through the interface of geocaching as a game, um, we would um, make we would make a sort of walking tour about the local and historic landmarks in the mission. Um, as we went along, however, what ended up happening was uh, we didn't have enough time. Um, some ideas seemed to be too complicated to execute. Um, and so what we ended up producing were um, games, board games, but they were individualized to each um, particular team that was there. Um, and they were um, sort of navigating their own stories um, and their own landscapes, whether they were real or imaginary. So this is the installation view. And, um, and the thing that I really um, took away from this iteration was, um, was that it was an interface between people and the landscape. And the game form is something that everybody is familiar with and they know what to do, but there's something that you could do to um, use as, as the form of a game. So the next iteration for this was um, I moved to Portland, Oregon, and um, for Shine a Light, um, 
a, uh, the project that I pitched was called To Find is the Thing. And um, it was a series, I think, of lots of coincidences um, that led me to meet you know, uh, this, this man named Aspen Ferrer, who was a game designer and was really interested in games, um, especially these sort of role-playing games. He also had a group of um, improv actors that he collaborated with um, often. And so To Find is the Thing um, was drawn from my research and work in interpretation and public engagement in museum settings. And I used, uh, I created a multi-layered game in collaboration with local game designers and improv actors at the Portland Art Museum. I was interested in drawing a connection between the qualities of artists and that of the trickster archetype in various cultural narratives from the Pacific Northwest to modern art. Masked as a coyote during the performance, I eschewed my familiar role as an educator communicating only through gesture. Working with other actors, I provided a character sketch of various trickster actors which each actor used to create his or her own script and costume. To the game players, the trickster actors provided clues, while other passersby received snippets of improvised performance. So from this work, I wanted to continue other methods of ensemble work and shared authorship, as well as explore the medium of rule-based play. Um, which leads me to um, uh, Matera the Movement Studio, which was something that um, Heather Donahue and I collaborated on at Fieldwork. And um, the charge that we had was to activate the Fieldwork windows and to do something public. Um, and she and I were sort of getting to a place where we felt that we were constantly being event coordinators or, um, you know, um, program managers or um, managing things and not getting to participate in the things. So we created a platform where we would do what we wanted to do and that would, and invite the public into doing that. So materials, materials and movement studio, <laughs> um, together with Heather Donahue, we created a shared practice of researching our interest in movement, dance, and visual art, beginning with the problematics of documenting choreography and the relationship between language and movement. Our inspirations ranged from Simone Forti to Richard Serra, from bicycli bicyclists to the supermarket. We often invited other non-dancer artists to join in our movement research. Sometimes we generated choreography derived from the verbs we observed on a walk in the neighborhood. And so um, this particular um, drawing of the arm span was inspired by a drawing that I, uh, or a photograph I saw in the century of the child. It was an exhibit about um, ways that children learned through, through play. And, um, and it was a, a younger child, a middle child, and an older child all drawing um, an arm span on the chalkboard. So this um, led us to um, kind of solidify a structure for how we wanted to structure our, our play. Um, so we would start each session with um, a warm-up, whether um, it was to warm up our mind or our body, some sort of exercise, um, something that we would play with. Uh, then we would share, then we would find some way to document, and then we would discuss the whole um, event. And um, Heather at the time was um, work, uh, working as um, an intern, a uh, cultural intern at PICA, and um, the artist Anna Craycroft was doing a, um, a multi-layered project called Come On Language, and um, she was in um, and she was uh, inviting uh, other artists, or other students actually, students and artists, to um, create emergent curriculum that was coming out of the programming that she was creating for Come On Language. Um, so here is um, uh, Ohana Maroni's um, instructor that I was able to then take to my school and use with my students. Um, um, and it was another um, opportunity for us to use our structure of the spine and to make up um, to make up choreography through uh, through games. Oh, and I lost my. That's okay. Um, and so um, when you walked in, you saw a spinner with certain cards. We were using the language of game forms like a spinner or a dice or, or cards, and we're using them to generate choreography by chance. Um, and then I happened to, and then I happened to watch a performance um, that was um, in a, in a home. It was in Dom's home, and um, 
and uh, some of the terms that she used um, to describe her choreography um, or her the elements that guided her research were um, two that stuck out to me in, uh, particularly. One was object-oriented choreography, in which choreographic intervention by the by audience participation um, was uh, was a guiding force. Visual scores were manipulated, rearranged, and composed directly by audiences. And another element was perfor real reality, um, which is highlighting the reality that the audience and the performer are involved in a performance where the primary content of the performance is the exchange itself. So those were things um, that I was excited about and how to put language to, and was um, and was excited to watch this performance and I think it has influenced me in some ways. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to collaborate with Don um, in a, uh, a performance that was based on being at table um, and um, using these uh, generated prompts um, as rules for our movement. We had objects that people could manipulate. And um, layered over was a text by Susan Sontag called um, Dancers on a Plane, um, which is in that book over there. So switching gears. Um, switching gears, I um, I was also making work about um, my personal cultural background, and um, I was this is uh, at my grandma's apartment um, learning to make kimchi, and um, I um, I had a, a kimchi making party um, with some enthusiasts um, at my friend Matt's house. And um, through Skype, my mom and my grandma um, gave us directions like <laughs> how to grind or grind the ginger, or how much red pepper should be put in. Um, and um, I was given an opportunity um, by Tori Abernethy to um, exhibit this um, at Lisa's gallery. And um, there was something about the presentation of all of this. Um, and the actual experience of it that I wasn't very happy with. Um, I, I definitely valued the experience of um, trying to figure out how to put an ex um, a, a past experience into the form of an exhibition, um, but it felt too much like um, it was being objectified as, as something on display, because it was. <laughs> um, and um, we can move forward. So this is what it looked like. Um, and the way that I, I feel like best sort of captured or documented it before one more time was through an email um, that I sent, and I'll just um, read a little excerpt. Uh, read a little excerpt of it. Um, so there was a, actually I'm going to skip the email and I'm just going to read um, the this poem that I I guess it was like a poem or writing that I wrote um, to go along with uh, a print that I made. So it's called kimchi of here. That's not real kimchi is my gut reaction to non-Korean meat kimchi. I'm suspicious of fusion, of fusion tacos, but I eat them anyway. They taste good. What makes something real or authentic? Hewan is the name my grandfather gave me, but it's not recorded in any legal document. Sometimes I wonder how I will pass down my culture. Dakuk on New Year's? A couple years ago, I asked my grandma to teach me. Cooking like choreography is learned better side by side. I'll teach you like Helmini teaches me. Perhaps we'll reach a different authenticity that is more direct and of here, with these ingredients, these tools, these jars, in this climate, with these hands and these palettes, the body measures and the body remembers. So I was able to do it um, in another iteration, and this was through um, the Full Plate Farm CSA um, that Michelle Sleinhart and, um, and her husband uh, run. And, um, and this, uh, Kim Chan was like a bigger kimchi making event, um, and it was at uh, the home of Harold's. And um, I think more than 20, about 22 people came and um, and participated um, in this event. The thing I was most worried about was for what kind of jars people were going to bring. I thought that they would be too, the neck would be too skinny, but um, it's fine. The honey jars were were the ones that looked most like the kimchi jars that I was familiar with. All right, so we can move forward. Um, so after both of these, where I was looking at um, both choreography and movement, um, as well as um, 
exploring uh, my own cultural background, I was thinking about these terms, translation, transmission, and transposition, um, as ways of really encapsulating um, the process of what was happening. And that um, and translation might even come from um, Anna Craycroft's uh, Come On Language, where it seemed that um, people of different disciplines, you bring them together and there's a, a period of translation that has to happen. Like, what do you mean when you say X? And there's a, a bit of translation. Um, transmission, I was seeing as the process of taking something directly that you don't want to change or alter in any form and pass down. Um, and of course, in those ways, um, like with the translation, there could be things that get lost. Um, and, but with transmission, like with an email or something, you're hoping that the exact form is, is passing through. And then transposition is borrowed from, uh, from music. And that is when you have something that was written for a piano, um, gets transposed into another key or for another voice, maybe for, for the voice or for um, a cello or a violin. And in that, you know that something has been transformed and you're listening to that as the audience or the listener. You're listening for that thing that got, uh, I guess, interpreted. Um, I will switch gears a little bit in terms of talking about the institution of school, of the classroom. And um, uh, I, I was invited um, by Michelle Swinehart to participate in a family day at the Portland Art Museum in the event of their samurai exhibit. And, um, and the, the samurai exhibit, the thing that we had said we would do was to provide um, a zine. And the zine would just be sketches from the students and their interpretations of what they saw in the exhibit. And um, at first, they were, um, I had asked them to think about things that protected them. Um, and after we went through the museum, it was very clear they, it was very clear to them um, that it wasn't really about protection, but it was about displaying power. And um, and so that's what our, our zine went through many different um, uh, revisions. And I kept having to change the cover. And um, and the content though was really something that I think. Um, was far better than what I was asking them to do. And it was in one of those conversations with Michelle in the room where they're like, I don't want to do this. This is dumb. And then we went into this bigger conversation of, of why, you know, of why they didn't want to do it. Um, which is, um, I feel that it happens again and again with me, with my students. When I, uh, when I let myself um, be vulnerable with them, um, we are taken to a place that is um, farther than I could have taken them if I just insisted on my own way. Another example of this is um, the chapter that we did uh, for, that I did for the Talk to the Gun book. Um, and I think the thing that was, the thing that made both this and the Talk to the Gun different from um, what my classroom is usually like is because of, um, and I'm thinking about a conversation that I had with Paul uh, Ramirez Jonas and um, Patricia when we were interviewing him um, for our open engagement when he was one of the keynote speakers. Um, he had said that in a classroom, there's a social contract. And as long as someone is required to be there or, um, or, uh, or is paying to be there, there's a contract that makes it um, unable to really be equal. Um, and so, but when there's choice and there's agency, then maybe um, there could be a difference in exchange. And I think that um, when, I, when I was open to changing the terms of the zine, or um, in the case of Talk to the Gun, when it was on a choice time, like during lunchtime or after school, that was when they had agency to be there because they wanted to, not because they had to. Um, uh, yeah, which is something I learned from that experience. Um, let's see, I'm running a little low on time, but I'll go 10 minutes over because we started 10 minutes late. I hope that's OK. Um, and on this particular. Um, String of numbers are our dates. Um, after attending um, Keith Hennessy's, um, well, actually, I think it was one of Emily's, Emily Royston's uh, talks with Keith Hennessy in talking about time. Um, Keith had talked about a personal political timeline. And he was talking about, he, had, he was structuring this discussion about his personal political timeline and asked us what each of our personal political timelines were. And I was kind of like, crap, I don't, I don't know. I've never really thought of my life in this way. Um, and so, um, so here's a little bit of interactivity. Um, I will pull up my script here, which I haven't 
really memorized yet, but I intend to develop this into some kind of piece. Um, if you would like to read or call out any of these numbers, um, I will tell you a line of what it means for what would it start for me. 1994. 1994. Kurt Cobain's suicide. I lose the vote for student council. Maggie gets the May Queen, and Brian gives me Siamese Dream cassette tape for Christmas. 1984. My little brother Justin is born, and the Olympics are in Los Angeles. 1945. 1945 is the end of the Japanese occupation of Korea. 2010. 2010 is the untalent show performance of Saturn Returns or The Year to Be Brave, and I apply to art school. 2001. 2001 are the 9-11 attacks. 1968. 1968. Mom wants to go to art school for violin, but Grandpa is against the idea. Art school is for key things. She is sent to America to study and attend Hollywood High School for ESL classes. Vietnam protests and Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. 1977. <laughs> 1977, mom and dad meet in the parking lot of the Chinese man at the release of Star Wars. I'll take one more. 1989, the, Mer the Berlin Wall comes down and Madonna releases Like a Prayer. Oh, okay, that's the last one. 1953, um, uh, grandpa's, grandpa's job was helping people to retrieve their land. This was, this was in Korea. <laughs> so, um, so what I hope to do, what I hope to do with this is um, uh, possibly use um, that for the remaining um, time that I have in the studio space um, uh, to develop um, a piece that is using the political, the personal political timeline and layering different texts um, and actions and sound and video. Um, um, this is someone that I just uh, that I discovered later on in the um, in my time here. His name is Charles Theroyan, and um, and it's really interesting um, that I found a lot of connection with him. He um, I, uh, he's Armenian American. He taught in high schools in Northern California for about 17 years. Um, he developed something called um, performance performance pedagogy. Um, and this book is called Toward an, uh, Toward an Art of Politics. And, um, and this uh, really helped me put language around um, why I was excited about the body as a way to explore some of these other ideas, um, which are both the political, the ethnographic, so like my cultural background, um, political, social, and some other things that I have yet to learn. That they um, I think I'll, um, I'll skip forward. Um, to the last project um, that I that I did with um, a group of people, um, it's called Movement Scores. Movement Scores for the Museum is an interactive performance installation that draws upon various narratives of how gallery experiences are visibly and invisibly shaped by the movements of museum staff. Developed over time through observation and conversation with docents, guards, art handlers, and museum staff, a collection of prompts and scores are interpreted and performed by a porous ensemble of dancers, artists, and non-dancers, including staff and visitors. So, um, so this uh, cover is designed um, by CL, who I worked with last year, who also designed um, the, the rule book um, that, I, that I had for those participants. And, um, and in thinking about scores, or rules, or prompts, I was thinking about um, ones that lead to expanded generativity and one that sort of make you feel like you're being instrumentalized or uh, lead to like a closeness. So this is another page um, excerpted from the book, um, which is, which of these leads to a door and which of these leads to a trap? And, um, and the words below read rule, lesson, assignment, activity, exercise, practice, inquiry, provocation, prompt, and offering. And maybe as you're sitting here reading these, some of these you have a, a reaction to, like, oh gosh, not another activity. Um, or, and some of them you are kind of open to, like, oh, what's an offering? Um, but the idea is that any one of these could be both and. 
it depends on our personal framework that we bring to the personal history and, and framework that we bring. Um, so I w I'm just now reviewing um, the, the footage or the, the stills from the event um, that are really exciting for me. And the thing, I think the moments that I found the most exciting um, are, are points of contact. Um, lead and follow was um, a, a score that, um, that we developed from uh, the docents. And um, I have that next here. So lead and follow, a score for the body and for space. After docents, when leading school groups to the galleries, when informing, interpreting, and making meaning from objects. Contrast to instrumentalize as one could in a position of authority and power. Variation, leading following after Andre Lopecki quoting Aaron Manning. You can return to that. Um, variation, drawing out and leading forth after Julia and Martin Beck. And I'll refer to that too. Um, variation, unfollow or deny. Variation, mislead. Variation in a canon and variation slowly, methodically, and in unison. So also in the book, um, and we can advance to the next slide. Okay. Um, also in the book, um, I, um, I share two different, um, uh, two different quotes. One by um, the dance theorist, the critical dance theorist, Andre Lepecki. And he is quoting um, Aaron Manning in this, uh, in this conference, uh, in this essay that he is giving. And he says, that, uh, that to follow is to initiate. In other words, to follow is to take the initiative of engaging with the leader and demonstrating through engaging that the leader is always the one who, by leading and because of leading, must follow. And so this is him quoting Aaron Manning, who is talking about tango. I begin by taking her in my arms. We walk. I am leading. But that does not mean I am deciding. Leading is more like initiating in an opening, entering the gap, than following her response. How I follow as leader, with what intensity we create the space, will influence how our bodies move together. Um, so it's really beautiful how he talks about this leading following, and I found a lot of um, relationship to this concept and that of Paulo Freire's dialogue, and that dialogue is this interchange and interplay that, is get, that gets passed back and forth. And the prompt for leading following is that no one is a leader and no one is the follower, and yet everyone is a leader and everyone is a follower. And so um, this particular moment, I didn't know that um, these two others were following me, um, and it became uh, a trio. We can go forward. Uh, another score was called Blanket. Uh, blanket, for the body, relational object. Blanket. Cover, uncover, wrap, unwrap. After preparators and art handling, an object for care, covering, protection, also for comfort. Blanket is folded at the end of every use. Variation, as a solo, as in the man who haunts the public courtyard and park blocks with the moving blanket. Variation, as a duet. Variation, as a trio. Dancer body is wrapped and moved by two others. Um, in this one, there are dancers on each floor, and the prompt that they were following um, has to do with, um, uh, I believe it was pleasure. They were just dancing however felt pleasurable. Um, but the other thing that was happening as people were witnessing from below is this beautiful shadow that was happening at the timing of the light and the sun coming in um, on Amanda. And then um, for... Um, the dancer on the on the this is the second, third, and fourth floor. Fourth floor. Um, for Jana, it was creating a reflection on the other side um, there. And then for Karen, she was um, she was not getting hit by light, but um, what was happening was really interesting seeing her dance on the end there. And so this score for the body and space witness after Jesse Hewitt and Larry Laura Arrington as in the act of watching an, invent, an event unfold from a 30-minute partner exercise and freedom practice workshop. Witness your partner dance in public, then take turns. You dance and your partner witnesses. Variation, listening deeply. Variation, contrast to spectator or bystander. Variation, or what can an audience do? So 
So this next one is lean and support. Lean, support, a score for the body, relational, after doses, an action remembered from teaching from an object. Also, a movement score for duet or group body. Slight leans and weight shifts. Who supports and who bears the weight? After Emily Goebel. If a museum is a place where objects go to die, then the task of museums is to reanimate decaying, lifeless objects. Um, variation after Tori and Jabari, positions between partners. So this is the group one. Um, and then there's the duet. And the last one was stillness. This is how we ended our performance. A score for the body, stillness after Andre Lepecki, as in standing firm in faith, in defiance, in protest, in solidarity, as in performing the musical notation for rest, very variation, contrast with inaction. So I'll close with um, with this and another statement about um, the practice of freedom, which is also referred to um, referred to in um, in the movement scores book. And um, some of my peers, um, when uh, when talking about the practice of freedom, um, some of my some of my peers would question, "What do you mean by freedom? It's such a weighty word." Um, and freedom from what? And I think that these are really important, um, really important questions that I'm still um, needing to discuss and figure out. But I think what I mean by freedom is an examining of agency in a given situation. What are the choices that are available? Who or what has enabled or established these choices? What can I choose from what is here, what is evident? What can I invent from what is not here or immediately apparent? What motivates my choice? Do I really have a choice? Um, examine my pleasures and delights. Examine my resistances. Are they reactionary, rebelling, resisting? Or are they reviewing, reflecting, reinventing, reimagining, recalibrating? Um, so this, uh, this last diagram is one that I um, made in response to um, an essay called The Act of Study um, by Paulo Freire and I thought I put it in here. Oh, you know what? Um, well, it's from an essay called The Act of Study, um, and it's uh, in a book. Uh, the essay was written for an introduction um, for a seminar that he was giving in Chile that had to do with reforming both education and agrarian uh, systems. Um, so yeah, so there's those who ask within that, there's those who try to find the answers, and then within that, there's those who keep on searching. Thank you. So um, I'm happy to take any questions um, or comments, observations. Yeah. Could you share more about your process to coming to? Choosing dance and performance as the form that you wanted to explore, the things that you wanted to explore in your final project? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that that comes from examining, examining what I am resistant to and examining what I find pleasure in. And the thing that I was resisting was feeling like I had to coordinate an event for someone else to participate in. And the thing that um, that was pleasing was getting to participate in the thing that I was creating, and then that also being um, like movement, this other aspect of dance, or kind of like, oh, my left hand, it's been here all along, and, and kind of looking at that um, in a way that could be incorporated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> say more. Um, I think also, in that improvisation, um, it's exciting that in, in improvising, there's an unfolding of an event that is happening. Um, and, and that kind of performance is exciting for both the performer and the audience. Um, and I think all of those things, like the possibility that it has to both lead and mislead, 
um, the thing that it has to do, the, the thing that it can potentially do to reveal a frame or rupture an existing frame um, are things that are exciting to me. And I don't know that I'm going to now, you know, pursue dance forever, but I'm, think, I'm, I'm seeing it as another frame and learning its possibilities and its limitations, um, but feeling really excited about what it has to offer right now. Especially in the frame of an institution where things are static and they're object as opposed to, um, and material as opposed to performance, which is alive and happening and related to the people who come to it. Well, I just wanted to thank you for always being a risk taker in the three years that I've known you and also bringing in realms of pedagogy and. Um, you know, the terms of these frameworks, translation, all these things into this practice, into social practice. I think that you bring a lot that isn't there or explored, so thank you for exploring that. It's been fun these three years. My question is about how often you look to other examples in art and other thinkers. Um, compared to a lot of the, our other colleagues' presentations, you quote a lot and you, and you bring in these other elements, or they're always, it's, it serves as a launch pad into these other kinds of work. And so I'm curious, um, why do you why do you think you, you are the person that does that? <laughs> oh, the one that pulls from all of pulls these. from all of these directions and yeah. synthesizes in, in this way. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it has to do with like my primary identifying as an educator and like one who's always studying and looking to the examples of others. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that as an artist, I'm like learning to let go of that and like invent my own. Um, but I think that's always my launching pad. Like I'm always responding to something that's there. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Thanks. I have two questions. One is that um, coming coming um, with a background as a creator and being a patient to a big thing from social engaged art. Um, it seems to me that you can draw exclusively from that practice or your experience as an educator to create art. Mm -hmm. I mean, you did in a way, but it wasn't the main focus. So I, I, I'm just curious um, why, you know, why it happened. And also, um, and also interested in hearing how your views or your practice as a theater change or not um, by you participating in the program. Can you rephrase the first question? The first question was like, why? Uh, why? Um, why pedagogy or like education was in the focus of the practice in, in the program? Being that you have such a strong background. In it. Why is it, or why? Is yeah. It? Why, is it? why? Why is it? Why is it? Why? Why? <laughs> Somebody help me. <laughs> yeah. Why? Why do you? Um, why do you use this one of your background to? But I, I don't know what I can say. I feel like, like I'm curious about the fact that you do this thing concentrated on on um, on education of pedagogy. So that I did not use it for my practice. Uh -huh. Like you, you decided to take on other routes, which is really great. But um, yeah, I'm not questioning sure. I'm just curious about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, it's because I have a master's in museum education. I, I explored that, I think, um, in, um, in my previous studies. Mm -hmm. And I think that the thing that excites me the most about what, what it's done for me, actually, is reframe what I think about pedagogy and what is exciting about pedagogy is that it's a duet and not a solo. Um, and that it's this exchange that is constantly happening and, and evolving as it happens uh, in the way of improvisation so, um, and, and performance. Um, so all of those things for me are exciting that give pedagogy um, uh, a, new, a new lens, a new frame. What was the second question? The second is really how has your practice or your views and education has changed? by participating in the program. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that um, I feel less um, I feel less of a pressure to um, create a curriculum that comes from addressing specific standards. 
and trusting that my own curiosities and inquiries will address those things. And so creating um, a classroom environment that is um, specific to the group that I, that I am committed to and specific to the time that we have and you know, all of those things, that, um, that what I bring to that um, it, it is enough and is valid. Um, so, and, and that I'm constantly learning with them as well. So yeah, so the classes that I'm going to be teaching next um, next year at the school, the public uh, charter school that I teach at, um, is going to be uh, an introduction to performance pedagogy, and I'm going to try out some of the things in there, um, and um, as well as uh, place-based work. So I'm hoping to um, utilize the um, and, you know, and because the students want to make things and learn the craft and skills and techniques of art. That um, you know, they'll be drawing the landscape, um, drawing a historical landscape, a social landscape, a, a you know, a psychological landscape. Um, so kind of taking um, what they might expect, but then adding it, um, adding other things that I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, one thing that I learned about your practice through this presentation is, um, you know, and it's always been there. Just, uh, observed it before is your uh, interest in language and um, poetry or, or uh, you know, art, art beliefs of language. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about that interest and um, how you see it influencing your practice or, or uh, what its position in your practice is. Yeah, um, I think that there's something that uh, like poetry is to language as dance is to movement, I think. Like it, um, there's a, a way that it can say more, um, or a way that it can allow other people to fill in the blanks more in a way that I feel like captures something better than uh, an essay or a narrative or um, some other kind of writing could. So. Um, I do. I do. I uh, I do want to write more. I do want to do more creative writing, and I do want to explore um, more of that form of writing if it's if it's relevant as a form of documentation, so that it kind of fills in uh, the 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 audience or the reader is left to fill in the blanks with his or her own experience. I think that's it. Yeah.